Yes. ठीक है. So do you want me to go ahead and start now? Yes, you can start. Okay. Uh, सबसे पहले everybody अस्सलाम वालेकुम इन पाकिस्तान. Um, I am uh, Shoaib Siddiqui, and I will give myself introduction in, in a while. Um, first of all, I really, really want to thank uh, Muhammad Rehan uh, f- uh, f- for contacting me and giving me a chance to speak to you guys about uh, diagnosis in endo. Um, and I will, I will brief brief you very uh, uh, why I chose this topic for you guys. Um, Rehan, um, uh, Muhammad Rehan, uh, uh, you know, I, I had a word with him, and uh, he was telling me that this AID is a new association, and I'm very happy to hear this. Um, you know, I hope uh, you guys do this uh, regular activities. It's very important uh, for learning purposes. Um, and this is a great opportunity. I was looking at the little uh, flyer you guys made, which you said it was a free for all um, lecture. So it's very nice, very good move by Muhammad Rehan and your team. Uh, I wish AID best of luck. I hope you guys continue with this stuff. And anytime you guys need my help with anything, I can. I'm uh, always available. Um, okay. So a little about myself. Okay. This is uh, this is me. Okay. Uh, actually, यहाँ पर रात के साढ़े बारह बज रहे हैं अभी और I had a very rough day today at work. I saw very difficult patients. तो मैं थका भी बहुत हूँ नींद भी पूरी नहीं हुई है. तो I'm I'm a little drowsy also right now. लेकिन So this is why I'm not turning on my video today, but uh, that's uh, that's me with my mic scope, with my loops, and we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll have a chance to meet again. So we'll talk about that. So basically, a little about myself. I did my bachelor's in dentistry from uh, Pakistan in 2000. Uh, after that, in uh, 2004, mein, I went to England to do my MDSC in restorative dentistry, uh, and I finished in 2006. Two years course was. I came back. um to pakistan i was teaching in a dental school uh, in karachi uh, for 3 years as an assistant professor i was teaching endodontics then i went to saudi arabia for 7 uh, years i was teaching uh, endodontics in a university in saudi arabia and then um now in 2017 i came to the us to do my uh, spe- specialization in endodontics my clinical training and i finished in 2019 so that was a two, two years course um uh, and now i've i started working in washington seattle um since september 2019 so this is my little journey uh and i'm still practicing here um uh, i do all my procedures under the microscope i i only do magnification endodontics i don't do endodontics with my naked eyes anymore i don't you can see loops hanging on my uh on my neck over there but i don't use loops anymore also i just use microscopes um But that's the way I was taught here. All right. So the, what was the purpose? Okay. So uh, why did I number one? Uh, uh, you want to familiarize yourselves, okay, with the common terminologies we have, okay? A uh, universal language होती है. So wherever you are in the world, okay, we, there's a certain terminologies that we use, and you want to. That's and that's how you communicate with people. Uh, using those terminologies okay uh aisa nahi ho sakta ki aap ek cheez ko kuch aur bol rahe hain aur jab aap kisi aur se baat karenge to wo kuch aur samajhenge usko so there there certain uh, terminologies that we need to uh, remember and we'll talk about the, those terminologies i know there are a lot of classification around the world about uh, endo ki mein pulpal disease ki uh, you know um aapki per, uh, periodontal disease ki lekin uh, yeah, ji yeah, sir yeah, kindly speak totally in english actually we have some international also okay. so they can not okay. understand urdu sure. so kindly sure. thank you thank you thank you oh, okay thanks. so uh, let me very quickly come back to the first one okay we want to familiarize ourselves with the current diagnostic terminologies why because uh, these these are certain uh, words that uh, you know the higher authorities have chosen for us to communicate with the patients with each other with with the professionals uh, so we need we need to know those okay uh, 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 what happens is that there are a lot of lot of classifications out there in books and papers everywhere some are old some are new but we need to know what is the most current one what is the most updated ones uh, so that we can communicate better okay uh, we're going to discuss different types of clinical tests uh, how to go about it how to do it okay uh what are the advantages mm, and we will we'll not go in a lot of details because i want to keep it very clinical for you guys okay 
we read all these things in the books very uh, as we find it in books in 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 in, in articles but today we're going to talk more about clinical stuff okay so that it's more applicable how to translate what you read in the books to your clinics okay uh, and uh, and then of course uh, you know endodontics is, is really a, a clinical field okay um, so i'm going to show you two or three cases just to show you how i it helped me in diagnosis okay uh, some some very interesting cases that we'll talk about in the end uh, so just hold on so uh, the reason why i chose this topic diagnosis number one uh, uh, aid is uh, is doing this as a first series um, in endodontics so uh, diagnosis i think is a very good topic to start with as as a first topic um, i'm not sure why this, i'm getting a red mark here anyways um, diagnosis is in my view one of the most difficult part of endodontics okay or or may if you if you if you compare to any field in dentistry diagnosis is the most important however diagnosis is also the most overlooked okay people tend to ignore uh, this this very important aspect of 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 dentistry okay and let's because we're talking about endodontics right now so i'll keep referring to endodontics from now um a patient comes to us you know we say hello hi how are you the patient tells us oh i have pain over here in this tooth uh, we look at the tooth and we go like okay fine let's do the root canal you know i see a big decay radiograph looks like this let's do this okay um but uh, we need to understand that there's a lot of information out there that we need to collect before we come to a, di a diagnosis which will lead us to to a treatment plan then which will lead us to a treatment okay so uh what are those informations okay there are clinical tests uh, that we need to do uh, there is patient symptoms that we need to ask them there is history there is a medical examination there is a medical history drug history so these are all this little, little information and this is like a jigsaw puzzle okay which is all all over the place okay so you have to pick up these pieces and very slowly you have to start coming up to you know making every every pick up every piece and start making it into a puzzle okay to start fixing it and the final piece it's is what is going to give you a beautiful picture in the end okay which is going to be your diagnosis okay so we need to understand that this is a very important aspect of of endodontics uh sometimes patient will have a multiple fillings for example in the lower mandible in the mandibular uh, molars for example okay and premolars now the patient is complaining of pain now you don't know because they all are all have deep deep fillings which one is it okay so now this is where you'll start asking for questions you'll do your clinical tests you'll do your radiographic examinations and then you'll come to a conclusion okay so when it's one tooth it's more easy but when it's multiple teeth on that side then you don't know which tooth is is the problem okay and i'm going to show you one case like that let's start with teeth complaint okay and dental history this is very important okay we need to know what the patient is coming for okay uh now i've picked up this form from uh uh from the pathways of pulp so uh it's very uh, easily accessible to everybody i'm sure everybody has a copy of pathways of pulp i'm sure you can find this online also um if you want if you don't have it you can maybe take a picture right now and uh, just save this on your uh, phones or laptops wherever see how sequentially is going okay it is very very important to understand uh what questions to ask what to note um could this is how it's going to lead you to what's happening uh, there was a study by bender where they said that if a patient is complaining of pain or or, or has a history of pain in a tooth that 80% of the time there's a chance that that tooth that it it is of 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 tooth origin okay it is not coming from anywhere else but it's probably coming from a tooth okay so if a patient is giving a history that i have had having pain on the side for a long time there's a there's a good good amount of uh, a good chance that he or she is has a tooth involved in that tooth uh, in that pain okay one important thing that we do here in the us uh, is if you look at this scale here okay let me just mark this here look at the scale here this is what we really do a lot okay um, we ask the patient to rate their their level of pain that they have 10 is the most severe okay so if a patient tells me that uh out of 10 i have pain of 8 right now so that means that they're severely in pain okay um what that tells me is number one that they're in severe pain number two 
after my treatment and after I do a follow up, okay, after like one month, I'll do a follow up after my treatment. Then I'll ask them now, what do you think about your pain level now? They'll go like, you know what, doc, I think it's zero now. So I can tell them, you know, before when you came to me, it was eight and now it's zero. So this is also a way to assess how your treatment has gone. Okay. So, and this is easy to um, also uh, communicate with the patients. Um, let's move to the next slide now. Medical history is unfortunately, again, one of those parts of, of history where uh, people do not pay much attention. Okay. They just very roughly ask, uh, are you taking any medication? Uh, do you have any, any problems like heart problems? But why do we ask these questions? Okay. This, this is very important. Number one, if, a, for example, a patient who is, uh, has stroke, okay. Or, um, or is epileptic, are you prepared in your chair or in your office, in your dental practice? If a patient has, a, an epileptic episode on your chair, are you ready to encounter it? Are you ready to face it? Can you manage that patient? Take it. That is one aspect of why you want to know this thing. Okay. Number two, you want to know their medical history. You want to know the drug history. Why? Because there are certain drugs that interact with each other. For example, ibuprofen or brufen that we have uh, back in Pakistan or Motrin or, or, or whatever ibuprofen that we have around the world uh, is a very common pain uh, killer that we use in endodontics or in dentistry. Okay. Uh, but if patient has a heart problem or is, or has a high blood pressure, for example, okay. And they, uh, and, uh, I think this, I don't know where this black line has come from. Um, can somebody reverse that so that it becomes clear? This is not coming from me. I am going to give me a second. Yeah, sure. I'll just continue meanwhile. So if a patient is taking blood pressure uh, medicine, then that ibuprofen is going to decrease the effect of the blood pressure medicine and the patient's blood pressure will stay high. Okay. So you need to understand which drug is, is, uh, is going to interact. This is why you want to know the drug history. Also, you just cannot give a drug to anybody. Okay. You want to know the allergies. Some patients are allerg allergic to penicillin. So you cannot give amoxicillin to those patients, okay? Or you cannot give any related drugs to those patients which can, uh, which act like or which behave like amoxicillin because then they can have uh, an, uh, an attack, okay? Very important, okay? Again, what I do is the moment the patient comes in, I look at them into their eyes like I'm, you know, greeting them like a good friend. But also at the same time, I am visualizing how they look facially. Okay. So I'm looking at the facial symmetry. Are they coming in with a swelling? Uh, can I see something there? Um, within day on my chair, then I, you know, I palpate. It's very important to palpate the, that region where the patient's saying I have pain here. Is a lymph node involved? Is a swelling bilateral, unilateral? If it's bilateral, most probably it's not of, uh, end origin. Maybe it's just some anatomical variation in that patient. If it's unilateral, that's something you want to think about, you know, is it, is it tooth related? Why is it swelling there? Is it localized? Is it diffused? Um, is it firm? Is it fluctuant? You know, we know all these things. Uh, you out, Outside the mouth, some people can have on the cheek or on the chin or under the throat, somewhere there, they can have a sinus tract where a tooth is draining from. So you need to look at these things also sometimes. You can miss it. Palpate the lymph nodes, like I said. Fever is one very big aspect. If a patient is saying, you know, ever since I've had this dental pain, I've, uh, I've started to have fever also. Then uh, uh, this is the time for the patient to, uh, you need to prescribe some antibodies to the patient because that means there is now systemic, uh, systemic involvement of that infection. Uh, so patient will probably have a big swelling and fever is a sign that the body is involved now and, and now the, you need to give some uh, antibiotics now, okay? Uh, that's why you want to know it. Um, also, it's very important to know your anatomical distribution of infections. Um, why, why is it that some people will have a swelling on, on cheek from outside and some people will have a diffuse swelling in, uh, uh, inside the mouth. And that's, uh, so you need to know the anatomy. Okay. You need to know where the tooth is and how it's related to the muscles around it. Uh, for example, if you look at this lower tooth here, okay. If this root apex is attached under the buccinator muscle here, okay. This is the muscle here. If it's attached below it, 
then whatever infection comes from here will go into the cheek, into the buccal space here, and you get an extra oral swelling here, okay? If this apex is over the muscle, then most probably it's going to drain out and go inside and you'll have an intraoral swelling and not an extraoral swelling. Uh, and this is, the, the, uh, and the, so, so we need to know, you know, so these are, these are little things that you need to understand what's going on there, okay? Um, okay. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so what, what comes after extraoral is intraoral, of course. So now you want to go inside and see. Okay, now remember, we are treating a patient, okay? We are just, just not treating one tooth. So when, whenever you go inside, the patient comes to you and says, I have pain in this tooth. Then they're pointing at the lower molar, for example, or the first molar. Evaluate everything over there because there are sometimes you will uh, be surprised. And in my, uh, in my experience, sometimes, you know, I picked up a few things. Like I picked up a lichen planus. I picked up a... Uh, uh, an oral cancer once like this. I was just doing a general examination. I just felt something, sent my patient for evaluation and uh, something bad turned up. So, uh, but it was very, luckily it was very early stages. So they got treated. So always look around, okay? So look at the soft tissue, look at the color change. Are there any ulcers? If you see any ulcer, ask them, you know, uh, how long has this ulcer been there? You know, uh, has it, does it heal? Does it come back? You need to know these things. You know, again, we talk about the swelling, same thing. If you see a sinus tract in the gum somewhere, go ahead and trace it. Put a GP in there, you know, uh, see how, uh, see where it goes. That's probably going to lead you to the right tooth. Sometimes you will have a sinus tract uh, of somewhere near the premolar, for example. Okay. And when you trace it, it's going to the molar. So you, because it's over a premolar, so you'll think, oh, it's coming from that premolar. So maybe the premolar is infected, but it's actually it's coming from the molar. So when you trace it, so that's that that garapocha that you place inside that sinus tract is going to take you right to that tooth. So that's a very good way to to assess uh, which tooth is infected. Okay, palpation is also important. Palpation, we do palpation because uh, it helps you to determine uh, if there is a bone involvement of that infection. Okay, so if you palpate, if the cortical plate is involved, you'll, the patient will give you uh, a sign that yeah, I feel that. Percussion also is very important because percussion means that your pedial space is not involved. So that means the, the, uh, the infection has moved from the pulp to the pedial now, to the, to the pedontal tissues now. Uh, remember one thing, uh, we read a lot of this thing that the, that, the, that the nerve or the pulp tissue inside the tooth does not have proprioceptive fibers, okay? Uh, these fibers will tell you or give you a sense of orientation. As long as the infection or the pain is coming from the pulp, the patient is not able to tell you which, which tooth is it? Okay, sometimes you tell, the patient will come and tell you, it's just this, I have pain on this side, okay? They cannot point at the tooth. That's probably because uh, the infection is just now in the pulp, in, uh, within the tooth, and it's not come outside into the bone, okay? The moment the patient starts pointing at the tooth is when you will know that, yes, now it's in the bone. This is why they're able to feel it, okay? Um, this, and this is why you want to do percussion also, okay? You tap on the tooth, the, the tooth, Feel the, the bone feels it and it'll give you a positive response. Mobility is important because you want to know if, uh, if the bone is involved, you know, is it periodontally involved? Again, you want to do periodontal examination. Sometimes you'll have pocket depths or you'll find a deep pocket. And now is that deep pocket because of a periodontal disease or is that deep pocket because of an endo disease or is it because of both? So you need to know these things, okay? Um, if it's very isolated, okay, periodontal, uh, pocketing depth, when you look at periodontal diseases, they'll have a very, um, you can say a very step kind of a, a pocket depth, okay? But an endo, if, it, if, it, if it's an endo pocket, or if it's, endo, if it's a pocket related to endodontics, or a tooth, uh, like an infection in the, from the tooth, then it's going to be a very isolated pocket. So you'll find uh, a very normal pocketing all around, but all of a sudden you'll find a very big dip, like a five or a seven or eight millimeters uh, dip in just one side and that's a, that's an isolated pocket that means that's that's an endo origin um, uh, pocket there okay now today's uh, uh, main theme is going to be around this thermal test and specifically cold test and I'm going to talk about why cold okay uh, so uh, in thermal we have cold we have heat and then we do uh, EPT that's the electric pulp test okay uh, then we have laser Doppler flowmetry and we have pulp uh, oximetry. These both, the last two ones are more, 
they're not out in the market yet but this, this is something that's being a lot researched on these days uh, they're very expensive uh, but I'm sure that very soon they're going to come out with something that's going to be more smaller and more clinically applicable. Right now, these two things are more used for uh, researchers, okay? Uh, one important point I want you guys to understand is when we talk about vitality of the tooth, okay? So when I'm doing a cold test, I'm checking for vitality. That's wrong, okay? I'm checking for sensibility because when I'm doing cold tests, I'm actually looking at the presence of nerves in the tooth. I'm not looking at the blood flow. Vitality of any structure in the body is because of the blood flow, not because of the nerve supply. Okay, um, so the theory. So we don't have any way to look at the blood flow right now. Um, if we go back to those two tests that I was, I was I, we talked about laser do Doppler flowmetry and pulse ox oximetry. These two are the tests that actually look into the blood flow and not the nerve. Um, so uh, right now we depend on the nerve response. Okay. So we actually, that is called a sensibility. So whenever we do tests, we say that we are doing pulp sensibility, okay? Not vitality. Um, but uh, some, some, some will argue, you know, that if there is a response from the nerve, then probably that's because the nerve is alive. Why is the nerve alive? But because there is a nutrition supply to the nerve. Where is the nutrition coming from? It's coming from the blood supply. That means there is vital pulp in there. That means the pulp is vital. Okay, so, so they, that's how they add it. That's how they come to the conclusion that if, it, if the nerve is alive, that means the pulp is also, that the blood flow is there, okay? Uh, but you need to understand that some studies have shown, like one by Mulaney et al., uh, they show that majority nerves will resist the autolytic process. So maybe the blood vessels or the blood flow will, will, will become necrotic, but some nerves will still be viable. They will still be alive. So you will get a response but that does not mean that the pulp is or the blood flow is still there. Okay. And this is a very important point in, uh, in anesthesia. Sometimes people will tell you that, Oh, I do a root canal in a necrotic case without anesthesia. I just drill a hole in the tooth and I just go inside with my files. But um, keep in mind that some nerves will be viable. Okay. So if the patient feels one thing you want to make sure is that when you do endodontics, you want to make sure that the patient does not feel pain. Okay. If the patient feels pain because you not give them anesthesia, um, then that is not good. The patient is, is will not like that experience. Okay, so always numb your patients, whether necrotic case or whether not necrotic case, just numb them. Okay, just give them a pleasant experience. Uh, so, like I said, the two uh, uh, indicator of pulp vitality are these tests now. Okay, but these tests are right now not too much available, um, and and is is these two ones the laser Doppler flowmetry and the pulp oximetry, which is more useful for trauma cases because when you have trauma, the pulp goes under or the nerve goes under shock. So the, that when you do the cold test on these patients, uh, they will not respond. Okay. So now the best way to see is because the nerve is shocked, is there a blood supply is still available and you can only find the blood supply by these two tests. Okay. By laser Doppler flowmetry, by the pulp oximetry, now by thermography because thermo thermography is looking at the temperature, if there's blood vessel, of course, uh, blood flow, it will be slightly more warmer. So these are the tests that are more good for your trauma cases. But of course, again, they're not very readily available right now. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, thermal test here, okay? Very commonly, you, uh, if you read papers, you read books, they always say that cold is preferred over other tests. Cold is the best test. Why do we say that? Okay, we say that because some people like Peterson et al. have done some studies where they showed that cold is a better way to test whether the tooth is alive or not. Okay, if you look at these two words, sensitivity and specificity. Okay, specificity is when uh, the test is able to tell you if the tooth is healthy. Okay, if it's if it's if it's alive, if it's healthy, if there's no disease. Sensitivity is the ability of a test. To, to detect disease, okay? So when we do cold tests, you can see that the specificity that it can detect the tooth is healthy or not is 93%, that's very high. If you look at heat, that's 41% only. EPT is 93%, that's good too, okay? Uh, we'll talk about EPT in a while, okay? So you can see the values for cold is much higher than the others. And this is why you want to keep, a, uh, we do cold tests more than the others. So cold test is more reliable uh, if you compare it with heat and uh, with electric pulp test, okay? 
some very common uh, ways to do the, your uh, your cold test is by using a little ice stick that you can freeze in your uh, little uh, you know anesthetic caps for example uh, you have uh, you have refrigerated uh, refrigerant sprays that you can use um, how do you use them is very important okay how do you use these sprays uh, some people will do the test and they'll not get the right results uh, that's because they don't use it the right way the right way to do it is to is to use a cotton pellet that is soaked okay that is it makes that cotton pellet completely wet now some people use this cotton birds or we in here in the us we call them q tips uh, these are very densely packed cotton uh, cotton fibers okay they will not soak this ice spray very very well so the moment you spray and you bring it close to the tooth it starts dissipating it starts going away so you don't get that the, the, the true cold over there okay so what's recommended according to studies is this number 2 cotton pellet okay the size is 5.5 mm this is what i use okay you have different sizes of cotton pellets okay uh, we use number 2 here okay this is big enough uh, to to soak uh, the refrigerant spray and keep it there for a little while so while you can test your tooth you don't want one too big because too big is is not is it's uh, will not get too wet too easily small ones will will uh, will dissipate and uh, the effect goes the cold goes away so you want a medium size that's number 2 okay so this is the ideal way to use your cotton uh, uh, pellet with the spray okay is so number 2 cotton pellet with your spray do that or you can use an ice stick okay because this will keep the temperature constant you need anything that keeps the temperature constant is what you want to use okay uh when do you we use ept then okay if uh, everybody has seen an ept device uh, people talk about epts a lot so when do we use it okay i use it when i want to know, uh, when i see that my uh, my cold test is is giving me a negative response that means that i feel the tooth is dead okay but i'm not sure if it's dead or not because it doesn't it doesn't look like it should be dead but the, the cold test saying is dead this is when i will bring in my ept and i will see if this current flow will uh, will give me a response or not okay so it it is more uh, used for uh, to assess if the tooth is necrotic or not okay for example uh, a case of uh, obliteration okay if a, if a, if a tooth is calcified for example if you look at this tooth here okay this is your um, in the us we call this number 9 this is your upper left first uh, incisor okay um, so you can see how calcified that is now if you do a cold test of course there is no dental tubules and there is no fluid shift right now that it will give you a cold response so this is when you will want to do a, an electric pulp test okay and maybe you will get an electric a late response but you'll get probably a, a response with the electric pulp test and that will show that no there is still viable tissue in there so this tooth is not dead okay so that's how you will uh, that's how you use it now you have false false positives and false uh, negative responses with this electric pulp test and that's important to know uh, when do you get these okay false positive means that uh, the tooth is dead okay but it's actually showing that it's giving you response showing that it's alive okay when does this happen that happens when you have partial pulp necrosis okay the tooth is necrosed inside is dead inside but it's partially necrosed because there's some viable nerves still in there. So you'll get response from the tooth and you go like, okay, the tooth is alive, but it's actually not. Okay. Uh, one thing uh, also, uh, if you'll find in different papers is liquefaction necrosis. That's one kind of necrosis where, where there's more, more abscess in there and the abscess acts like a, like a fluid uh, and, and takes that electric current and gives it to the PDL and the patient will respond. It, it transmits that current and the patient responds, you'll feel that the tooth is alive, but it's not, okay? If the patient is very anxious, you place, the, you place these little tests over there and the patient will give you a response, but actually there is no, the tooth is dead, okay? Um, again, if there's no isolation, you do this electric pulp test, the current will flow to other teeth and you'll get response from other teeth, okay? And, uh, and same thing with metal restorations also. Uh, false negative responses means that uh, the tooth is uh, alive but is giving you a, a reading that is a dead tooth okay so it's called false negative again like we talked for example calci calcified canals okay calcified teeth they will respond uh, show, they'll they'll show as if they're dead but they're not dead they're still alive okay when you have recently traumatized teeth the nerve goes under shock so they, they won't respond but it's actually still alive so you want to wait 
till it comes back to normal. Okay, so you, sometimes you have to wait for two months uh, till the nerve comes back to its health and then it starts giving response. If it's an immature apex, means if it's an open apex, okay, it's, it's still developing. You will not get response from these tests. Why? Because these tests rely on A delta fibers and A delta fibers in an open apex is still not developed. Okay, it takes time to develop. So you'll not get, you'll get a negative response, although the tooth is still alive, okay? There's some drugs that, of course, uh, you know, some like tranquilizers, which, will, uh, which affect the, uh, the test. And of course, again, the poor contacts, very important, very important to get the contacts. There's a little debate, where should you place these tests, okay? If I'm using electric pulp test, where in the tooth should I place it? If I'm using a cold test, where in the tooth is the ideal place to place it so that I get the right response, okay? Now, some studies, or some people will tell you, uh, let me bring this up, that the ideal space, uh, for example, placement of the electric pulp test is at the incisal edge here, okay? Cold test, some people will tell you, is also over here because that's where the pulp horn is, okay? Some people will tell you in the middle of the tooth. Frankly speaking, if you ask me, I do it anywhere I get a response from, okay? As long as I'm away from the gums, I want to stay away from the gingiva because the cold can get touch the gums and can give false uh, readings or it can go into the circular fluid and give false readings again. Um, so as long as I'm away from, this, from the gingiva, I, I can use it anywhere over here, okay? Uh, in this region, sometimes if I don't get a response from the label side and I'm confused still, I will go and go do it from the palpable side or the lingual side, okay? Uh, anywhere where I get a response from, okay? Uh, same thing for the for the lower molars, okay? For the lower molars, they said the, the mesobuccal cusp is the right place to put it. But again, sometimes I'll put it right over here in the, in the buccal side in the middle somewhere as long as I'm away from the gums. Sometimes I'll come lingually, I have to retract the tongue from that side. Sometimes I put it occlusally, okay? Again, wherever you get the response from, okay? I'm gonna get rid of this right now. Okay, the special tests. Okay, these are the special tests and we're going to talk about some of the special tests that I did in my cases. This is a bite test. Okay, you have a tooth sleuth that helps you to determine, uh, you know, you put it in each cusp and you check. Um, one thing I want to highlight here when you do, uh, when you're looking for cracks in the tooth, there's, a, there's, there's, this, uh, there's this saying, okay, that um, when the patient bites, they don't feel the pain, but they feel, when they feel pain on release, that's a sign of a cracked tooth, okay? Uh, now they're saying that's probably that's not true, okay? If you're testing this teeth or you're testing a tooth with this, uh, with any any equipment like a tooth flute or, or these cotton buds or Q-tips or cotton rolls, even on biting, if the patient's giving a response, then you need to suspect a crack in the tooth and then look for other tests like transfibrillation, like, uh, like staining, uh, which is mentioned here. Uh, look into the other things, okay? Because maybe most of the, uh, maybe a lot of cracks were being missed just by believing that there is pain on release only. But now they say that just pain on biting can be a sign of a crack also, okay? Test cavity, not everybody, not a lot of people do test cavity. It sounds crazy that without anesthesia, you start drilling into a tooth and if the patient jumps with pain, you go like, ah, oh, that's the tooth. Uh, that's, that's very uh, barbaric, okay? I, I wouldn't suggest that. Selective anesthesia also, also is very rarely used, but I'll show you one case that I did that I, where I used it, where you want to, uh, you know, if you're not sure which tooth is involved, you numb the tooth one by one, okay? Tooth by tooth, and then see if the pain is going away. Once the pain goes away on, on, a, on a certain tooth, then you, you, can, you, can, you have a good guess that that's the tooth that's involved. And I'll show you one example in the end when, I, when we discuss cases. This is one thing I want you guys to pick up from this entire, um, uh, so far, whatever you've done, okay? Is that you need to communicate very well with the patients. If you want to get the best out of your clinical test that you do on the patients, you need to communicate with the patients. Tell them what you're doing, tell them why you're doing it, and tell them what to expect so they're ready for it, okay? They will only give you the right response so that you get the right diagnosis if you will tell them what to expect, okay? Don't just say, okay, I'm going to test your tooth, open your mouth, and you put coal on the tooth without even them knowing what, what you're doing, okay? Tell them what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then tell them what to expect. 
tell them how to react respond to you tell, tell them how to communicate back to you so that so that you know that they felt it and what response to for example um, i'm uh, you know dr shweb or, or you know you have this you complaining of this tooth right now you're in pain uh, i'm going to test this tooth with cold okay so i'm going to apply a little cotton pellet which has some cold spray on it okay i'm going to apply this on this tooth if you feel any response raise your left hand and i'll know that you felt it don't wait for pain even if it's very slight just let me know because this is going to tell me if the tooth is alive or not if you do not tell me i will not know and will miss it now the patient knows number 1 i'm going to test the tooth number 2 that i'm going to test it with cold so i'm going to, i'm supposed to feel something now number 3 if i feel it i need to tell the patient i need to tell the doctor and and that will help the doctor know if the tooth is alive or not okay some patients if you don't tell them uh, if you don't communicate to them they will wait they are expecting to feel pain because that's what dentistry is in their mind dentistry is all about pain in their minds so they will they will wait for pain so they will not tell you so they're feeling the cold but they're not telling you because they're not feeling the pain so what is your your uh, final answer after the test is oh the, the patient did not give me any response that means the tooth is dead it is necrotic i need to, i need to do a root canal on this tooth but that is not right the patient felt it but you not tell them to give you to tell you the answer okay so so this communication very very important throughout not just diagnosis even when you're doing root canal preparation you're putting rubber dam on uh you drilling the tooth whatever uh, epistocators you putting the lip clip on whatever you doing tell the patient what you doing and why you doing it and what should they expect and it will always help you okay radiograph is a very important part a very important tool uh but should not be the only way to detect your things okay uh i know a lot of people they still use the films the sense uh, uh, i would highly recommend people now move towards digital radiography because of a lot of reasons number one is uh, less radiation okay uh, you can play with the images you can uh, make it larger you can change the uh, settings make it more brighter you know look at you can you know look at certain things uh, you can save it very easily okay uh, and you can and you can move it around with you carry those x rays in, in a little usb with you and use it wherever you want uh, you can print them you can share them wherever you want uh, the biggest pro that i find with digital x ray is that it doesn't tear with time you know with time if you look at those films that we used to use before they, they can very easily get scratched with your nails or if you put it anywhere else it gets scratched by paper also uh, and number and, and very because i like to teach you can use digital x rays uh, to present also okay there is cbct uh, we'll talk about cbct in some other lecture whenever i get a chance next uh, very uh, recommended very good tool and then they now they coming with with mri because cbct and digital radiography involves radiation now they coming up with something less you know how to omit radiation and still get good results uh, and they coming up with mri now in dentistry okay so uh, let's let's see where we get there this is one thing i want to talk about right now uh, and we'll talk talk about radiography in some other lecture sometime if if i get a chance but always always before you start uh, always take more than one x ray on a patient okay take different angles take different horizontal angles okay that will help you see it is still a 2d view but you have three different 2d views now okay if you take one straight one mesial angle and one distal angle now you have three different views so like this you're not missing on anything okay so one study in 1970 okay showed that from 74% if you just do one x ray it goes to as high as 90% accuracy if you get more than uh, uh two x rays okay so that this helps you in diagnosis okay if you do more than two x rays so two to three x rays is good okay on one tooth these are the terminologies i want you guys to keep in mind right now this is the most current one okay uh, by the ae this is right now pulp diagnosis okay uh so they broken it down to normal pulp which is of course a normal pulp with, with no pain um then there is reversible pulpitis okay when you do your tests the patient will feel slight sensitivity but then it goes away immediately okay then there is symptomatic irreversible pulpitis where uh, the patient comes to you symptomatic means the patient is presenting with pain okay irreversible pulpitis when you test the tooth it will it will read sensitive it will read inflamed okay 
so that will be symptomatic irreversible. Asymptomatic irreversible is the patient's coming to you with no pain, but when you test the tooth, it's showing signs of in inflammation. Okay. Purple necrosis is, of course, the tooth is dead, so it's, it's not going to respond to anything that you do. And previously treated is 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 a, is a root canal that has already been done. Okay. So now the patient's coming back with failure, for example. So your diagnosis for that tooth is going to be previously treated. Okay. Uh, you will not say it is uh, irreversible pulpitis or it is asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis or it is purple necrosis. It's been treated. It has root filling in it. So it's gone. Is the diagnosis for the, the purple diagnosis is previously treated. Okay. And previously initiated is somebody who started it but not finished it, and now you've seen that patient. It could be that I started the case and I'm referring it to you. So for you, the diagnosis is going to be previously initiated. It could be that I started the patient, but the patient never came back to me. Now the patient after two years has gone to somebody else. Your diagnosis still is going to be previously initiated that somebody had already started it. Okay, that's that's what it means. Uh, so how do we determine if the pulp is normal, reversible? We talked about these three big terms here, okay? How do we know what is what? Normal is, is when you apply cold, it will be a very gradual sensation, okay? It will not be of discomfort to the patient and it will not linger after you remove the stimulus, okay? So it does, it comes very slowly. So when you apply, the, for example, you apply the cold test, the patient will, after a few seconds, tell you, yeah, I felt it. When you remove it, did it go away? Yes, it went away. That means it's normal, okay? Reversible is that you place it and the patient will feel it immediately or within a few seconds. When you take it away, then it goes away also immediately, okay? That's reversible. The reversible is maybe because of caries or something and if you remove it, pulp comes back to health. Irreversible is when you place it, when you place that cold uh, on the tooth, the patient will have a very sharp, a very painful response, okay? And that lingers on for a while. That's irreversible. Okay, that means that pulp is not going to come back to health, and probably now we have to jump in. So now the big question here is: Does this apply clinically every time? Okay. Uh, so now we know these three things. We know everybody knows. You know what is reversible, what is irreversible, but does this apply clinically all the time? Uh, the answer is no. Okay. Um, patients have different pain thresholds and they will respond differently. The best way to do this, to see uh, what you need to find out first is, what is the normal in that patient, okay? I may be a tough guy, so uh, I may not feel pain that easily, okay? Somebody else is, is a little weaker, that person will, even if you touch the tooth, will, will jump with pain, okay? Maybe they're not in pain, but they'll just feel it, okay? So for, you need to assess on that particular patient what is normal for them, from there, you will decide, okay, this person does not respond very easily to the cold test. That means this patient's normal is that they do not respond to cold very easily. Because I tested 10 teeth, all 10 did not respond to cold. That does not, that does not mean that all 10 teeth are dead. Okay, that means this patient's response to cold is not res no response. But a, sp a specific tooth on that patient will respond. So 10 teeth are not responding, but one tooth is slightly responding and the patient goes, oh yeah, I feel that. That tooth is the problem. So in that patient, the normal is no pain on cold. Okay, does not respond at all. But on that tooth, he responds slightly. That tooth probably is the, is the, is the culprit. Okay, so always uh, determine what is normal for that patient and then go ahead and compare your results uh, with the rest of the teeth. So always do multiple teeth and then come to that, uh, your suspected teeth, and then decide. Uh, does, does that mean that whatever we feel that is reversible and irreversible, does that mean that histologically that's the, that's the condition also? Is that how the pulp is really inflamed or not? Um, well, Setzer and Bender said no, okay? Uh, that does not reflect. So whatever the, the if, if, it's, if it's irreversible, does not mean that the pulp is in an irre irreversible condition. However, Rikuchi, uh, very uh, more recently, has said that yes, uh, it does reflect. So if a patient is coming with the irreversible, there's 84% chances that the, that the pulp is involved irreversibly, okay? Um, so, uh, so now newer studies are showing newer studies. Now, one thing I want to just add here, when we talk about these periapical and, and pulpal diagnoses that we just talked about, uh, these are terminologies that have been evolving with time, okay? There was, before there was juvenile and, and chronic and acute, 
but now they're changing things okay they're changing because then they're understanding disease more i will not be surprised that after maybe a year or two years maybe five years later they will come up with a new classification right now this is the current classification so just stick to this okay so we determine the pulpal diagnosis what is inside the tooth now we need to know what is the periapical diagnosis what is how is the tooth involved or the bone involved around the tooth okay remember we talked about percussion test we talked about palpation test this is what we're seeing we're seeing the periapical uh, involvement so now we need to know the periapical diagnosis okay normal apical tissue means that there is no uh, sensitivity to your percussion and palpation test and we look at the x-ray there is a nice laminar dura with no widening of the pdl space so everything looks good so a tooth can be can have irreversible pulpitis because this, the the nerve and the pulp is involved but the bone is not involved so it, it so your 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 diagnosis can be irreversible pulpitis but with normal apical tissues so this patient will still need root canal treatment because the nerve or the pulp is irreversible okay uh, symptomatic apical periodontitis means that the patient when you when you do, do all your tests the clinical uh, producing clinical symptoms uh, the patient will will feel that pain okay that's symptomatic asymptomatic is that the patient is not in pain but you on the radiograph you're seeing some kind of lesion okay there's inflammation of the uh, 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 but the patient is not giving you any signs okay there's no there's no clinical symptom uh, chronic apical abscess and there's acute apical abscess acute apical abscess means that now there's a swelling okay uh, and and these are usually painful there's a lot of pressure to the nerves uh, in the bone so the patient will feel it okay uh, there's abscess formation chronic apical abscess means that there was abscess but is there and but there is no pain why because now there is sinus tract when is this, when there is a sinus tract that abscess from that from the tooth is now draining it's like tap your, your kitchen tap okay you open the tap up and now all the water starts flowing out so that that sinus tract is like a tap in the body okay all that abscess that forms inside the tooth starts draining and this is why the patient does not feel the pain uh, usually patient with sinus tract will tell you i never have pain that's because all the pressure is coming out okay condensing os osteitis is a, is a more radiographic kind of a periapical diagnosis where uh, you, where you see that there is a whitening around the or ossification around the uh, root tips and especially in the molars okay uh, and that's a sign of a very very low grade long standing infection or inflammation in the bone there okay i won't say infection but inflammation actually one last point okay i want you guys to consider this you guys are working hard to reach to a diagnosis okay you've done all the tests you've asked all the questions you've done everything okay and you're still not able to come to a diagnosis okay what should you do okay again you have read the books you've read the articles you've heard my lecture today and you're wondering what you know i've done everything that he told me i've done everything the book tells me i still cannot come to a diagnosis what should i do this is something very simple that you can do refer it there is no harm in referring your patients to somebody who can help you to diagnose that case and then you can refer it back to you for treatment okay refer do not play with the patient okay remember we are we are taking oaths to help the patient if you cannot do good do not do harm also okay so if uh, if you're not sure what's happening always refer it to a senior or to somebody who's more experienced and they can always help you out okay uh so that was the little lecture on diagnosis i kept it very brief i tried to keep it more clinical for you guys so that you guys can understand um if you i'm not sure if you are able to take questions here but uh, if you have anything um you can tell mohammed rehan later and maybe they can always uh they can always uh, get back to me and i can i can always ask some questions okay um so let's let's go through some uh, some clinical cases like talk about some special uh, things that i said that you know we do um this is a case of an upper left central incisor okay uh, this was 57 year old patient uh, no significant medical history the complaint was i have a bubble on my gum over the tooth okay uh, now when i took his history his history was that he had trauma in 1980s okay where his anterior crowns had fractured and then he had to restore them uh, with crowns okay for for aesthetic purposes clinically when i looked in there uh, i could see a sinus tract okay but the sinus tract was not traceable i could not place a gutta percha in there uh, why that happens is because soft tissue you know when it drains it drains but when it stops draining then it will heal okay but does not mean that it's not going to drain again it drains again later 
and there was no there was no mobility however there was a 5 mm pocket uh, label okay um, so now if you look at the clinical picture you can see there's a little let me just draw this for you i know you can see it but just in case you can, this is the bump that he was complaining of okay that's a sinus tag but you can see it's healed partially okay so i could not trace it okay and uh, let's go to the next one here when you look at the radiograph so you can see the root canal was already done okay he has a crown on the tooth and you can see there's a lateral uh, canal maybe that has some sealer and the sealer is going into the bone and you can see that there is if you look very closely uh, you'll be able to see this radial loosened region here okay so my guess was you know that maybe there's a lateral canal that was not cleaned and that pushed sealer into there and the sealer uh, is now infected and that in that sealer is causing all this infection here makes sense okay so uh, we told the patient you know uh, now now note one more thing okay one more thing before i move forward look here so the lesion is here this is probably why i have given that 5 mm pocket here but if you look at the apex there is no lesion here you can see a nice lamina dura here no widening of the pdl just like the lateral incisors over here okay so they all look nice and healthy here okay the problem is coming from the side so my guess was that this problem is probably coming because this lateral canal that was not cleaned properly so we told the patient you know uh, either we do the root canal again uh, and see if we can fix it but uh because there is sealer and maybe the sealer is infected why don't we do a surgical procedure where we can raise the gum and uh, remove this clean this whole region up over here and then put the flap back maybe that will heal because if this is infected sealer then that that needs to be removed okay so the patient agreed he said yeah i want to take that chance so we went ahead you can see this in my sinus uh, i was trying to uh, trace a uh, little bit over here and i just couldn't get too deep but you can see over here it just came clear so we did a cbct okay we just want to see exactly what's going on so you can see here uh, that that's the let me just mark this again for you guys uh that's the tooth here that we look, that's in question okay uh everything looks nice and healthy over here you can see the slight widening over here you can see sealer sealer traces over there uh if you look here you can see the sealer in the, in the lateral canal here so it's, it's becoming quite evident what's going on here okay so uh like i said the treatment also option was to redo the endo and observe okay we do it again and then consider surgical if the treatment does, is not successful since we suspected a crack now because the patient said that uh, you know i had trauma long time ago and there's there's pocketing also now so we suspected a crack also maybe there's a crack maybe it's because of that uh, little uh, sealer over there so we said you know why not do an explore, exploratory kind of a surgery where we just raise the gum just to see because some things we cannot see we can i can only see the crown what's going on the root probably as sometimes you have to raise the gum for that okay so uh, we said you know maybe we can do uh, some kind of an exploratory surgery assess the tooth over there and then if everything looks fine we'll do the apical surgery if not then we'll talk about uh, extraction and implant so the patient said okay fine let's go for exploratory surgery uh and he said you know i just want to keep the tooth so just see whatever you can do so we went ahead we raised the gum okay um you can see that this is the bone defect here let me just change the color because everything is red here maybe we'll use the color um uh, we'll use black here you can see this this is the bone defect here this is where i was getting the pocketing okay so what i did was oh i'm going somebody's i'm getting all this can you can you get rid of these marks please because that will stop me from showing what i want to what i what i want to show maybe i'll move to the next one okay uh, thank you very much i'll move to the next one here so now if i i clear up so there was granulation tissue okay there was some granulation tissue over here so i removed that now you can see this this something like a crack being evident here now okay can you see this line here now that's something that's we like okay it looks like that's a crack okay so what i did was remember we talked about staining let me see cracks we want to stain teeth okay now oh, guys can you yeah so 
what I, what we did was we put some methylene blue there, okay? And now you can see that this crack is so evident now, okay? So that's when I told the patient that the tooth is cracked and it's no use saving this tooth. So um, because we were already open, I gave him the option, do you want me to call the oral surgeon or the periodontist? Because I was training to become a, uh, an endodontist, so we only do root canals. We don't do uh, fillings and we don't do extractions. We don't do scalings. So I told them, you know, I'll probably call in somebody who can do that for you. And maybe they can start talking about implants. He said, uh, no, not right now. Just close it and, you know, we'll talk about this later. So I put the gum back and we suited it. And, uh, you know, and that, that's, after, that's exactly after three days when he came back to get the suture out. So you can see the healing has already started there. Um, but that was an interesting case, okay? Um, so we did that exploratory surgery just to see the final that there was a crack and the tooth has to come out now, okay? So I, I, I did not follow up after that. I don't know what's going on with him right now. This is a case of selective anesthesia. Remember we talked about selective anesthesia where you uh, sequentially numb every tooth uh, separately and then see if the pain is going away. This case was very interesting. Okay, I'll tell you why. This guy was a 19-year-old guy and he was referred from the faculty practice Okay, by one, from one of the faculty members. His, his complaint was that just a few days ago, he had some uh, his premolar upper right premolar restored. And after that, he has had severe pain uh, that does not let him sleep anymore. And sometimes he, when he came to me, he was in tears. He was actually crying. He was in so much pain, okay? Uh, dental history was asymptomatic before treatment. Faculty notes mentioned the restoration of upper first premolar one week ago. So it was only after his first premolar was filled occlusally and distally. So it was a DO filling. Uh, that the patient started having severe, severe pain, okay? So we did the clinical examination. There was no swelling, no pocket depths, and nothing of that sort. We did the pulp test. Now the pulp test, this, this is interesting here. Uh, when I did the cold test, upper first premolar was sensitive to cold, but the second molar right at the back had severe pain, a severe response, sorry, severe response to cold, okay? The palpation, all sides, no, nothing, no response there. Percussion, upper first premolar was sensitive, and upper second molar, there was no response. That means percussion negative. That means in the, in the second molar, uh, the PDL was not involved. However, the first premolar was involved PDL, okay? Uh, the PDL was involved there. So now this is getting confusing. Look at the cold test. The cold test says that yes, premolar is sensitive, but the percussion test is also sensitive. That means everything is saying that this, mol this premolar is, is the cause of the pain. But if you look at the second molar, the cold test is highly responsive. He's in severe pain with cold, but there is no response to percussion. Okay. So let's look at the x-ray. If you look at the x-ray, I'm sorry, I don't have a very good picture um, right now. But if you look at this, this is the that deep filling he got uh, done from the faculty pack. Now this is a little close to the nerve, but it's only after this that he started feeling a lot of pain. Now, I don't know if I'm wrong or not, but I do feel like there's some kind of widening over here if, you look, if we look very closely, but maybe maybe because we are looking at the tooth, so it looks like there's something over here, okay? This is the second motor here. You can see how he has a deep filling, an old deep filling here also. It's very close to the nerve, okay? So, oh, let me get rid of that, I'm sorry. So this is the first, this is the second molar here. Okay, you can see it right here. Okay, you can see how deep that filling over here is right, very close to the nerve. Okay. The nerve and the filling are hugging each other. Okay, they're, they're so close to each other. So what was my conclusion? What did I do? I was not sure what's going on. So the patient was lying on my chair and I was confused. You know, he's, and, he, and the, the thing is the patient is pointing at the first premolar. He keeps pointing at the first premolar. He's saying, I, I feel it on my first premolar and the pain is going towards the canine. So, and, he keep, and his hand is on that side. His hand is on that tooth. Now I'm getting confused. Second, pre, second molar is showing exaggerated response, but the first premolar is what the patient is complaining of. So I ended up doing uh, uh, here. Let's, let's go through this, okay? Second molar shows an old measles restoration. We just talked about this. Tests were done again with the same result. So I kept doing the test again and again, same result, same result again and again. So I ended up doing um, this, uh, the anesthetic test there, okay? What, what happened was the patient was lying on the chair 
uh, when I was talking to him, and I was getting ready to do the root canal for the first pre molar because everything was favoring the first pre molar right now. But he started having severe pain all of a sudden before I numbed him. This was a good time for me to test the tooth. So I, I numbed his pre molar a little bit on the buccal side. His pains slightly started going down. That, that showed that, yes, the first premolar is the reason of the pain. So I said, okay, fine. I think this is the, the, now we have the right tooth. Let's go ahead and start this now. But after a few minutes, before I could start, he said, wait a second, I'm getting severe pain again. It was so severe, that he started crying again on the chair. This time, I numbed the second molar. I numbed the second molar. After a minute, he went like, wow, I do not feel this pain anymore at all. I tested the tooth with cold. It was not responding anymore because I had already numbed it. And uh, I left him for a few minutes, you know, on the chair. And he said, you know, doc, I feel much better right now. I'm not feeling anything. I told him, you know what, buddy? I think it's your second molar. That's the problem. Let's leave the first molar, uh, pre molar right now. Let's do the second molar. And he, I said, you know, and today we're just going to open up the, the tooth. We're going to remove the nerve, the, the pulp. We'll put some uh, calcium exercise, some medication in there. And I'm going to put you on a follow-up and see how you do. If your pain has gone away completely, we'll go ahead and finish the root canal. Uh, otherwise, we'll look into other teeth again. He agreed. We went ahead. Okay. So we went ahead. We started. And surprisingly, in the second molar, you know, there's always a deb debate about do we have MB2s in the first molar or not. This second molar had MB3. So you can see over here, if I point this out to you, this is the MB1. Okay, this is MB2. And this MB3, he had three mesobuccal canals, okay, which join in the end. I'll show you the X-ray in the end. Uh, so very interesting case, okay. Uh, so and you can see I've put some calcium oxide paste over there. Uh, so when he comes back to me, uh, when I went back inside the canals to clean, uh, there was a lot of bleeding for the palatal canal. So I started looking for an ex for an extra exit because sometimes you know there's viable tissue in that extra canal. And it bleeds a lot. So I went uh, with the file to look for that extra canal, extra exit, and I found it. I cleaned it, and uh, the bleeding immediately stopped. Okay. That's my final x ray there. Okay. You can see that. Uh, I filled all the canals. Now let's take another view. Okay. That's the palatal. You can see that uh, there's a, lot, a little sealer and gutta percha gone inside the canal there. A little sealer outside, but the sealer after one year had gone away. Uh, now look, look at this measle root here. Okay. Look at this measle root here. You can see it's very wide here. Let me show you some other angle, okay? So where you can appreciate those three canals much better. Look here. I'm sure you can make this out now. Let me just draw this for you guys. That's, that's one, okay? That's two. And this is the third one here. And they all join as one. And if you'll note, it splits into two in the end. So the three canals, they join and split into two. Right, that was a very beautiful case. Uh, I followed this case for one year uh, till the time I finished my residency, and the patient uh, was very thankful. He said, "You know, doc, I'm so grateful that I'm pain-free now, and uh, you 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 picked up the right tooth." Uh, and so the the first premolar was nothing but just referred pain. Uh, it's, and I was very shocked. I was very surprised at the science of the of the brain, how it perceives pain and how it shows pain. Uh, it was the first premolar that was the culp uh, not the culprit, it was the second molar. Uh, and that's just the observation I took a picture over there. So the lesson that you need to learn from here is the site of pain is not always the same as the source of pain, okay? The site of pain can be referred pain, the source can be somewhere else, okay? This one last, uh, I want to show you this case, the role of the CBCT. Uh, the 70 year old man came in, okay? He had a uh, root canal done one year ago by an endodontist and then a gold crown placed uh, on the second left molar, okay, upper second left molar. Uh, but he never had this, uh, he always had sensitivity on that tooth. He could not bite on that side. He always had complaints, even after the endodontist had done his work. Okay, so when I did the percussion test, it was positive, okay? So when you look at the x-ray here, now you can see uh, this is the second molar, okay? This is the MB canal filled. Okay, so you can see this is MB, this, now let's look at this. Uh, your first molar has MB1 and MB2. So this looks pretty good. And this was done by the same, same endodontist, okay? Um, and this is, this is the second molar with MB filled. 
This is the palatal field. Uh, so that was the distal buccal and this is the palatal field here. Okay, everything looks fine. Uh, so I'm not sure why he's having pain. Okay, so um, I couldn't see anything. It actually looks fine. I don't see any radiolucency around the roots there. Everything looks good. So I wasn't sure why he's having percussion pain. So we said, okay, let's do one thing. Let's go and do a CBCT. We did a CBCT and you can see this is big lesion around the measle root there. Okay, it's very evident, but I'm super gonna draw it for you guys. There you go. Big one around the measle root, okay? So we said, you know what, let's, uh, let's look at different angles now. Let's look at different views. And if you look at this here, let me begin the other X also so that we can just go ahead and talk about it one time. That's the measle root of the second motor, okay? This is the measle root of the first motor. You can see MB1 and MB2. This is MB1 in the first molar, uh, in the second molar, and there's a spot here. Can you see the spot here? That is your MB2 of the second molar. So MB2s are present in second molars also. Okay, don't forget that. It's just not it's just not for the first molar. So you can see MB1 here, and there's MB2 right here. So that was the cause. And if you look at if you go more apically with the CBCD, you can see right over here, big lesion. There's no lesion with the distal buckle. There's no lesion with the palatal, okay? Only with the measles. So what we did, we said, okay, you know what? Let's just treat, because this was done one year ago, so everything looks healthy. Let's just treat that one root. Let's just treat the measles root. So I just made a small hole through the crown, and you can see I eventually found uh, the MB1. I cleared the MB1 of the garapercha, and then I found MB2 also. There's MB2 right here. I had to dig, you can see the dig mark over here. I had to dig for the MB2 inside the, uh, the root there. That's when we found it. Oops, sorry. I'm just about to finish the okay, game, sorry guys. So you can see the two files are in there. It got pushed out a little bit into the bone there, but that's okay. And uh, that's my final fill there, okay? Uh, so you can see here, MB1 here. MB2 here, okay? So that was that was also a nice case where I did this uh, selective retreatment there. That was a fun case. And again, I followed this patient for one year. He was fine, he was very happy. Um, so we need to understand this very nice thing is that we see what we look for and we look for what we know, okay? So you'll only look for what is in your mind. So the only way to open your mind is to, is to read, to attend lectures to uh, and to constantly keep revising what you know, okay? This is the only way we'll know these things and then only we will look for these things. Otherwise, you'll miss it. Okay, it'll be right in front of you, but you won't see it because your mind does not know it. Okay, uh, we just, today I just talked about pain that's regarding uh, endo origin uh, because uh, this is a very vast subject. You know, there's a lot to talk about, but I want to keep it basic. Uh, so whatever, whenever you get a, a response from the tooth and the pain is still there, probably... Uh, that will help you to determine if the, if the pain is coming from the tooth or if it's coming from the muscle or the sinus or from the joint. So your, your pulp test is important. If it's not coming from the tooth and your, your final feel is that it's coming from some, somewhere else, it's coming from a muscle, it's coming from a joint, then you, re, you refer the patient to somebody who can deal with that patient then. So, but your pulp test is, is first, okay? If your pulp test tells you that this tooth is infected, then the tooth is involved endodontically and you need to do endodontics on that on the tooth. If the pulp is responding normal, but the patient is still saying I have pain on the side, then maybe the tooth, the pain is coming from some other source, like it could be trigeminal neuralgia, it could be some kind of a headache, whatever. Okay, it could be joint issues, it could be the muscles are, are, are tender. So, so you need to refer that patient to somebody. Okay, and in the end, of course, this little prayer that we hope that we all get some uh, more ill, more education. Um, Again, I want to thank uh, I want to thank AID very much for giving me a chance to speak here, uh, especially Mohammed Rihan who approached me. Uh, thank you, Mohammed Rihan, very much. I I wish you again the best of luck to you and your team. I I'm sure you guys will do good. This is a good initiative, uh, and anytime you need my help, I'm always here. Uh, I don't know if you if you're going to take questions right now or you want to do it for later or not at all. That's your wish. Uh, but thank you again. I really enjoyed speaking to you guys. I I hope you guys will benefit from this. I, I hope you guys will learn from this and uh, feel free to contact me anytime you guys want uh, or to learn something else, okay?
Uh, Thanks so much, Dr. Swayb. Yeah. Actually, there is a question in our chat box. Mm-hmm. In case in lower quadrant where the inferior alveolar nerves like the posterior teeth, how do you handle such case? Um, can you repeat the question again? Okay, let me let me read this. Uh, is it about selective anesthesia? Interesting case. Yes. My question: In case in lower quadrant where the IAN supply all posterior teeth, how do you handle such case? Thank you. Okay, that's a good, very good question. Uh, again. Uh, IAN is going to block the main nerve, yes, uh, but you don't want to give the IAN because if you give the IAN, then uh, if you want, if you give the inferior alveolar nerve block first, then you're blocking the whole jaw. So now, if you want to do selective anesthesia, you're not doing selective anesthesia anymore. That's that's for that segment you're doing general anesthesia. So over there, you just want to numb again the specific tooth because your 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 anesthetic solution is going to diffuse to the bone. And go into the nerve, uh, nerve, and 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 stop that uh, depolar depolarization effect of the nerves. Okay, so uh, that'll be enough to to reduce the pain uh, for a while without giving the block. So you still want to do local infiltrations. So when I say selective anesthesia, it is for local infiltration only. You don't do blocks in there. So if it's uh, if it's a lower and in the posterior where the inferior alveolar nerve is involved. You will still do selective anesthesia. You'll still give uh, a buccal or lingual infiltration, and you do not give the whole cartridge, because if you give the whole cartridge, uh, it's about 1.8 milliliters of solution. Okay, that is a lot. When you, for example, if I want to numb the premolar, the first premolar, if I give the whole injection, if I give the whole cartridge, that will automatically spread to the second premolar also. Now, if the pain is coming from the second premolar, it, I ca I cannot test that anymore. Okay, so you want to give half. A cartridge, or just a little bit, just to see if the patient's pain is going down or not. That should be enough. Okay, same thing for the molars. Um, I hope I've answered that question. Okay, thank you. If if anyone has any question, currently ask in the chat box so that Doctor Shreep can answer it. If anyone have any. I like the, I like your fire. Nice and colorful. Thank you so much. If someone has not registered, he can register, and you can attend more courses also. Hope so. Okay. Our endodontic series will be continued by Dr. Shweb Siddiq, and there will be a quiz after this session by 28th of the May. You can attempt that. On that basis, we will issue the certificate if you will score more than 70%. So there's a question that says that uh, they're asking how to clean lateral canals. <laughs> well, that's that's uh, that's not easy, okay? Lateral canals. Uh, first of all, you need to know where they are. Then you need to go in with with bent files. You know, you curve your file a little bit, then you, you need to find that exit where that exit is. So it's not easy. Uh, remember one thing: you can only see into the till the orifice, okay? Once you enter the middle third, and if the canal is straight, maybe you can see through the. Through, I can see till the apex with my microscopes. Uh, but if the canal is curving, uh, or the root is curving, then you can only see to an extent. The rest is all tactile sensations. So endodontics is a lot about tactile also. Okay, your fingers have to be very well trained to feel these things. Okay, uh, lateral canals are not easy to locate. They're not easy to prepare. They're very, very difficult to find. And once you stick your file in those canals, they're very, it's very easy to break a file because they're very tiny canals. You can break a file easily in those canals. Okay, so uh, they're not easy. So uh, lateral canals, uh, you usually, if you uh, will just do a very good cleaning of the main canal itself, your lateral canal should get cleaned by itself because you'll see a lot of people don't put their files like I do. Uh, I put my I like to find lateral canals and put my files in. Sometimes, if I'll ever get a chance, I'll show you those cases also. Uh, I do poke into my lateral canals and I do fill them, but uh, a lot of people don't do it and 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 they have success also. Uh, so I will recommend that if you want to clean your lateral canals, just use a lot of hypochlorite. Leave the hypochlorite in the canals for a little while so that it starts uh, you know eating up the tissues in the lateral canals and clean it. Uh, that's that's the best way to do it. Uh, but if you want to, if you're asking how to put my files in there, that's not easy. That's very difficult. 
I have trained myself very much to do that. So, and my my finger is uh, my fingertips. They talk to me. They tell me where the file is going. So I can actually visualize my file where it's going right now. So you know that's how I know. Um, yeah, I, I I I hope I've answered the question. Main thing is main thing is irrigation. Irrigate a lot, and that's to clean your canals. Any more questions? I think there is no question. All of the mm -hmm. participants, thank you so much for attending, and thank you especially to Dr. Shweb who delivered this awesome lecture and started this series. If anyone has have to get certificate of this session, you can attend the quiz by twenty eighth. You will be updated on our Facebook page. You can like and follow it and subscribe the YouTube channel also, so that you can be updated with recent lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.